So entropic forces are effective forces, but they are they are real. So you know, force is the negative gradient of uh, potential. So if you have a free energy instead of um, or just the regular energy, then the force will be minus a gradient of the internal energy plus the gradient of the entropic term, temperature and entropy. So temperature is constant. So you have your regular force, so the change in the potential energy, and then you have this entropic force, which is the what drives the system to a state that has more entropy, right? So the change in, in entropy of the system. So if you put, if you have a rod and then over here you have a heat source, a lamp or something, Mm. If you, if this is turned off, how is the, how is the distribution of the velocities of the molecules in here? Uh, sorry, the number and the velocity, so the distribution. How does it look like? Like a distribution kind of. Yep. Like that, right? Why is it? Why is it called the near to the heat source? Why is it what? Called the nearest to the heat source. You're you're cutting off. Can you repeat that? If if it was a if it was a Maxwell Boltzmann, right? Yeah. Before you connect it. Or no, yeah, I don't think it's any wrong. Before you yeah. turn it on. Okay, I see. It's gonna look like that. And then when you turn it on, how does it look like? Skewed to the left? Is it gonna look skewed or no? Like shift to the left? But I know not to the left. To the right. To the right, yeah. So actually in this area over here, you're gonna have um you know some atoms are gonna be uh they're gonna have a lot of energy and so their velocity is gonna be pretty high. So it's gonna look yeah, it's gonna be skewed to higher velocities. Uh then you're gonna have a peak, let's say something that looks like this. Right? So this system, the purple one connected to the heat source is out of equilibrium. Um, if you turn off the heat source, then it will go to the black curve and it will be in equilibrium. So the system wants to be in equilibrium. So uh, it will try to go from this distribution to this one. How does it achieve that? It has to move some of the energy that these particles have to the particles over here. So that's why the particles start to, the energetic particles start to move to the right while losing uh, some of their energy. So the system is trying to go to a state of higher entropy by this is the, the, the state of higher entropy, the equilibrium. So thermal conductivity, it's, uh, it's an entropic force. 
Another example is if you have a balloon with some gas over here, you have your ideal gas, you have your heat source. It's, you turn on the heat source and the balloon is going to expand, right? Have the same number of atoms. So over here, you know, you will probably add the uh, PDV, but this is the only real, or I guess traditional uh, energy that exists in the system. As you increase the temperature, the average internal energy increases, but the fact that it expands, you know, it's just a system trying to find a state of higher entropy. So this is your entropic term. This is an entropic force as well. So entropic forces are you know, well understood, uh, real, at least in a, you know, they don't have a, a force carrier, but there's definitely a, an effect. So it's like shadows. It's like what? It's like shadows, like shadows. Like it can, if you have like a laser pointer, can you put it like from one side of, side of the moon to the, and then like you raise it to the other side. The, the lightness is like, well, the darkness goes faster than light. Like it breaks the speed of light barrier, but it's uh, not really doing it because it's just darkness. But how does that change the entropy? I'm thinking about, like, you mentioned a, a laser. So you have all the waves, uh, the waves are in phase. Mm -hmm. They're traveling. So if you, if you only look at, you know, one set of waves, uh, they're not expanding or anything. So the, the volume that they occupy is the same. Uh, I'm not sure the entropy is, will be changing. You know, while they're traveling, of course, you create entropy to create, you know, the, the light and to, and when it is absorbed. But this is more like, you know, just look at it. Uh, the system will try to, just like it minimizes the energy, it maximizes its entropy. So it, it tries to go in, in two directions. They can be the same direction, but in general, they might be two different directions at the same time. Um, so uh, Ted Jacobson Uh, proved I guess you can also say show but it is a it is mathematically rigorous uh, that you can derive the Einstein uh, field equations from um, very simple assumptions. Assume that uh, if you have a black hole, the uh, horizon, well, the, the area of the event horizon is proportional to the entropy of the 
black hole. And um, that they change the, the energy flux, so the heat is equal to TDS. So this is the entropy S. So that's pretty, pretty awesome, no? So at least close to black holes, the force of gravity is, is an entropic force. So that is not uh, controversial at all. You know, this, this is accepted. So what is controversial um, Berlin in 2009 uh, considered, you know, space. So more flat space away from black holes to have the uh, an event horizon and did a similar treatment to uh, to the Jacobson treatment and he recovered the one over R dependence for gravitational uh, for the gravitational force. So some of the predictions of the theory have been confirmed. Uh, some other predictions um, are, you know, have been incorrect. And there is currently um, a discussion, I guess, in the field, you know, whether uh, the theoretical treatment to go from uh, close to a very, you know, close to a black hole to empty space is a valid assumption, um, you know, all these things. But this has definitely, you know, spurred uh, interest in this kind of, of theories. And if you get that, you, know, you get, you have the potential to explain the rotation curves without um, dark matter. But you know this is controversial, and I think I think good science, right? Um, it's making predictions; it's getting people interested. Uh, so it can predict. So you know, a regular, um, I guess, in our environment, close to the Earth, close to the Sun, uh, it is the same as general relativity or Newtonian uh, dynamics, but very far away, you know, it's where you have the, the, the difference. So for intermediate structures, so it, it works for galaxies, it works for um, stars, but for, for clusters of stars, uh, it does require a little bit of help. So something like 20% of the mass should be, uh, will be dark matter as opposed to 100%. But you, know, you can find this 20% in traditional baryonic matter, you know, maybe gas that is difficult to see or something. So it's still possible. And the big advantage of or they, I don't know if it's an advantage, but uh, some of the one of the things that draws people into this theory is that it has no adjustable parameters, so it's completely, you know, for from first principles from from theory. So, you know, don't don't forget that there are you know, other 
ways in which you can explain these rotation curves. Uh, and there's people uh, working in the field. That being said, you know, most people believe, uh, most scientists think that dark matter as an actual substance is more likely. So what are possible forms and, and origins, or I guess forms of this matter? So what is uh, baryonic matter? You guys know this, tell me. Well, it's made out of uh, baryons, uh, which are uh, essentially protons and neutrons. So they're created from combinations of quarks. So baryonic matter can be in gas form. And if it is in gas form, then it can be atomic gas. So this will be mostly, you know, H gas. Can H clouds of gas uh, be the, the source of dark matter? Why not? Why not? Because we can see gas, like a hydrogen gas. What if it's, how can you see it? With um, emission or absorption lens. Right, so it will be a 21 centimeter. Um, emission. We don't see it. So it's not H gas. What about ionized hydrogen? So you have your, your protons or electrons. And you know, you have to consider that this could be very diffuse. Yeah, this one will produce um, x-rays, <laughs> right? When it's being, uh, when it recombines. So you can rule it out as well too. The other possibility is molecular. Uh, gas. So it could be H2, you know, other things. Is it molecular gas? You know, are these dark matter halos created from molecular gas? It will have to be really, really cold so that it doesn't produce um, infrared radiation. It is, it is rotating, so that's how they, they cool down. But molecular uh, gas clouds definitely can get really low temperatures. Um, the main reason is this has not been completely ruled out. But the main reason people don't think that it's molecular gas is that it will absorb uh, UV radiation from um, you know, the other galaxies. So when the light is traveling from the other galaxy to us, uh, if you know, we had molecular gas halos, uh, we will see a reduction uh, in the intensity of that wavelength. And that is not really observed. 
but you know, it might be the case that, I don't know, maybe we're not looking in the right direction or something. So unlikely, but not completely ruled out. What about uh, dust? Can it be dust? Um, it will absorb visible light you know, when the light is struggling to us. So it has the same problem as uh, molecular uh, gas clouds. And in addition, it will radiate in the infrared. So I yeah, pretty much rolled out. The other idea, um, very compact, but uh, massive, compact, uh, halo objects. Um, Machos. <laughs> so I'm I'm going in this order, you know, because I think it makes more sense, but keep that in mind that macho is a reaction to weekly interactive massive particles. Wimps. So I don't know, back in like late nineties, early thousands, you had to be in one camp. You were either a macho or a wimp person. Um, so what are these massive compact halo objects? Well, uh, they're compact, so they can be like stars, um, they can be black holes, they can be neutron stars. They're massive, uh, so those objects uh, comply with that condition. And they're in the halo, right? So I guess one idea is that you had a bunch of you know, neutron stars that were reflecting radiation, and they were creating the gravitational uh, interactions that you needed to create uh, galaxies. So I'm going to put it over here. So one idea, main sequence stars, but we will see them. So go down. What about neutron stars? Could the dark matter halo actually be a bunch of neutron stars? They could. But we understand the formation of neutron stars pretty well. So they have to be created in a supernova explosion. And in the supernova explosion, they will release uh, heavy, well, not in the uh, normal sense, but metals that are heavy. So uh, a lot of iron, um, a lot of, um, I guess manganese, chromium, like all these uh, heavy things. And we will be able to detect them. So neutron stars ruled out. What about black holes?
Well, we do not know as much about what comes out, you know, when a black hole, when a black hole is uh, created. So the current um, understanding is that they do not produce a supernova explosion, so they just whoop and they grab you know, all their material. So we don't know as much about how they enrich their, um, their environment. But even if they take you know, everything and they don't enrich the environment at all, uh, in the numbers, so in the number of black holes that you will need to make up for the dark matter halo, you could definitely uh, separate your interactions um, from you know, like you, you'll have discrete black holes, right? Instead of having a uh, diffuse um, halo of matter. And so that will disrupt the galaxy in different ways than, than the dark, um, than the diffuse halo. So black holes, um, pretty much for that. What about light bars? And you know, they are far away uh, enough from us that you know, they're very tiny, so we will not be able to see their, their light. Could it be a bunch of white dwarfs that create the dark matter halo? Any ideas? Well, similarly to neutron stars, they create stuff. So they're not going to create, um, you know, iron, but they're going to create carbon um, and nitrogen and oxygen. And so we could detect that, uh, but we don't really know too much about whether that material is going to stay there or it might you know, fall pretty quickly to the galaxy. So there are some things that we don't know. Um, but the other thing is that you could look um, at galaxies that are redshifted by a lot. So they're very far away, uh, so very far back in the past. And before having a bunch of white dwarfs, you will need to have a bunch of uh, main sequence and then red giant stars. And maybe, you know, it's beyond the limit of our instruments right now, but this has not been observed in, in, in galaxies that are far away. So white dwarfs, not completely ruled out, but unlikely. So for a very long time, you know, the main um, candidate was brown dwarves. So as opposed to white dwarves, you know, they will not create anything too visible, right? They will not uh, create red, giant, uh, red giants. Uh, so we will not observe them in uh, redshifted galaxies, and we, we don't observe anything like that. So, you know, maybe it's just a bunch of, and you know, they're, they're stable for many trillions of years. So they will still be there. So is it possible that a bunch of you know brown dwarfs creates the dark matter halo in galaxies? So the observation that ruled uh, brown dwarfs out was based on microlensing. So if you have 
a regular star and there's something you know, dark that moves in front of it. Uh, the light from the edges of the star is going, uh, it's going to bend. So you see uh, a transient lensing, right? So it happens, it takes uh, a few months or even a few weeks, depending on what you're looking at. So for brown dwarfs, uh, we looked at the large mag mag magajanic, ah, magic, magic, cannot pronounce it, Magellanic, yes, brown Magellanic cloud. Um, and if the dark matter halo, you know, there's a halo for uh, the LMC and also for the Milky Way. If the halos were created of brown dwarfs, then uh, you, know, you know their masses. Um, you know how much mass you need to keep the, the velocity, uh, the, rota the velocity of the rotations flat. So you know how many brown dwarfs you should have. And based on that, uh, you have density, you should see, you, you can know, uh, or you can calculate how often you should see these microlensing events. And it should be in the order of like uh, a few thousand per week. And that was not observed. So they observed, uh, I think a few hundred per month. So brown dwarfs, very promising candidate. You know, if you don't want to bring up anything that you don't know about, but it's not brown dwarfs. So the other big problem with machos is that from big bang nucleosynthesis, we know, you know, it, it predicts really well uh, what is the abundance of every chemical element that we see in the, in the universe. I know there was a, a paper early in the semester about that. So if you had um, stuff in, let's say, brown dwarfs or even black holes uh, that was baryonic in nature, that will affect, you know, the, the, the predictions of uh, nucleosynthesis. So it seems like matter is not baryonic, you know, dark matter. So what is non-baryonic matter? Well, there could be leptons, so like electrons. Um, they can be other stuff that we don't know about. So is it possible that all the dark matter halos are created by electrons? or neutrinos. Well, having free electrons is the same as having uh, ionized gas. So we know that that one is not the origin of dark matter halos. What about neutrinos? They do have mass. Uh, this was not really, and this was suspected, but not confirmed until like 2007 or so, 2008. Uh, but they don't have enough mass to account for the halo. So, you know, we can give them, we can give them a check mark, but it's just not enough. They do account for some of the dark matter.
what are what are um, other options? Strange. Strange what? Matter, stars, planets. Well, strange is created of quarks. I mean, the, of uh, strange quarks. Um, I guess it's possible, you know, we don't know, we don't know the properties of uh, strange quark matter, but it's difficult, you know, as far as we know, it's difficult to create it. I think it has to be in the center, in the core of uh, neutron stars. And it definitely interacts. With, uh, with other matter, so we will see you know, the radiation. That's a good one. What else, Jacob? Yeah, you know, something similar to that would be the primordial, primordial uh, black holes. So what are, what are these black holes and how are they different from the regular ones, from the baryonic ones? Are those the ones that were created like at the very first? Yep, yeah, right after the Big Bang. Yeah. So they have uh, small masses. Yeah. I mean, they probably, I'm almost for sure they exist. Uh-huh. Um, they were also, I guess, partially ruled out by uh, microlensing. Mm -hmm. So the same idea as with, uh, with brown dwarfs. Uh, there's just, you're know, not... The, the, the frequency of the events, of microlensing events, is not high enough to support the theory that there's a bunch of primordial black holes in between uh, the LCM, I mean the L and C and the Milky Way. Um, but that's only considering or assuming that the distribution of primordial black holes is homogeneous, which is definitely not a very strong assumption. Like they, they probably you know, congregate in certain regions. So they partially ruled out, but not completely. And you know, we don't have, we're not very, we don't have a very good imagination, so we got to WIMPs. So what are WIMPs? Well, we know some of the properties that dark matter should have. Uh, it should be weakly interacting. Can it be non-interacting at all? We suspect of its existence then. I guess it interacts it gravitationally, but is there a, a, another way that they can interact? Well, it should interact with light, right? Or at least they do not interact with light. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, not very often. I don't know with what else then. Electromagnetic? No, it would be. So the W, you know, the, the weekly, 
actually comes from uh, the weak force. So, and then they're they're massive, like right? so. In order for them to be, uh, okay. So the other characteristic that dark matter halos or the stuff that makes them should have is that it is cold. So the velocity of the dark matter halo particles is low. And that's because if they had a high temperature, they will disrupt the formation of, of galaxies. So you will see, um, instead of having your elliptical galaxy or your spiral, they will be uh, torn in certain directions. And the same thing here. So you will have some matter coming out of them from the, the interaction with, with, the, with the halo. So that puts a limit on the velocity, so the temperature, and the cross section. And this one we have seen it often. Uh, so it has to be uh, about three times ten to the negative thirty-two um, meter cube per second. So substantially lower than that the cross-section for um, like, you know, hydrogen interacting with ED or, or something like that. Um, so based on these characteristics, you can get the mass of these particles. So it should be about 100 giga electron volts. And the mass of the proton is about one giga electron volt. So they are about a hundred times heavier than a proton. And they interact either exclusively via the weak force, um, or if they interact uh, via the strong force, then that interaction is weaker than the weak force. No question. Mm -hmm. Is that mass like an upper limit or like a lower limit on, the, on where it should be? Or like an actual approximation? It's an approximation. Um, so, you know, if it's, let's say, a thousand, uh, one order of magnitude, higher, then the velocity will be like too low, the temperature will be too low for what we observe. So this is based on the large scale structure of the universe and simulations of the large scale structure. So if it's too low, it will just clump in a single thing. Um, and yeah, they're probably particles. So the idea, I guess, is that because they interact with each other um, so weakly at the beginning of the, uh, right after the Big Bang, they were being um, created and annihilated because at the same rate, and then the universe starts cooling down. So 
the creation and annihilation is not in equilibrium anymore, so they start to annihilate just like matter or regular matter. Um, but because their interaction is weaker, they stop uh, annihilating, at least to a substantial degree, uh, earlier in the history of the universe than regular matter. And that's why you have more dark matter than regular matter. So you know, these, these characteristics explain, um, I guess are consistent with a lot of models. The other situation is called, but this, this is not necessarily related to, uh, to this other part. It's called the uh, wind miracle. So if you relax the requirement that the number uh, of quarks and leptons in the universe have to be conserved. So let's say that you, know, you grab a bunch of uh, quarks and electrons and you shake them and some of them start uh, some of them become leptons, right? So you have more leptons than quarks. Um, that is not possible in, or at least it's not part of the standard model. But if you relax that, um, then you end up, and I, I don't know too much about this stuff, it's called uh, supersymmetry. And so this is an extended standard model. Uh, they predict, so this will predict the existence of a particle with these characteristics. So massive with approximately this mass, weakly interacting with approximately this cross section. Um, but of course, you know, the fact that it predicts something that you need doesn't make it real. But who knows, maybe it is. Do you think it's like, like analogous to how mass and energy were like connected at some point? How like, they thought they were conserved at first, but then you can like switch between mass and energy. Maybe you can like switch between those particles too. I think that's a pretty good analogy. So you go to like a, you know, a more general level of your theory, and then you see that things are actually kind of the same. Um, but you know, this is not established by any means. But I think your know, physicists are kind of excited that it might be true. Um, so well, they WIMPs will have their anti-WIMP protocol also. And their annihilation will create gamma rays and also neutrinos. And you have an idea of what the energy of the gamma rays has to be and based on their mass. Um, so you don't know the mass exactly, but you have an estimate because to looking at sources of gamma rays in the universe uh, of that particular uh, wavelength. So, you know, maybe in principle, you can see, or we will be able to see, uh, to detect uh, WIMS in an indirect way by their interactions. The direct way to detect them will be to create them at CERN or a linear accelerator. And you know, this is not out of what is possible. Um, it will require some, probably some upgrades. And then you could see you know, if you put them in a high enough density, maybe you can see them interacting with, uh, with atoms or something. So then you will see, you will have direct evidence of their existence. 
So yeah, it's, it's possible. And I think science is moving in, in this direction. There's a lot of people trying to detect uh, WIMPs. It's kind of a difficult task, though. I don't know if I would recommend it as a research career. You might wait your whole life to detect a WIMP, and then you don't know if it's a real one. But if you're into uh, like detection, uh, detector science and all that stuff, I think it would be exciting. All right, so that's what I have for you today. Any other ideas, questions, or comments? No, how was the how was Thanksgiving break? It was okay. Hey, yeah. I ate, I ate a lot of turkey for like three days. That was good. Well, I don't eat turkey, so. Oh, sorry. I, um, tofurkey. Huh? Did you eat tofurkey? Actually, no, we didn't find any. <laughs> but some other things, yeah. yeah. All right. Um, if there are no comments, then I'll see you on Thursday for the last lecture. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye. See you on Thursday. See you. See you on Thursday. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Mm.